This is Special Prosecutor Larry Clayman. I'm the only lawyer ever to obtain a court ruling that a president of the United States committed a crime. For truth. For competition. As a young lawyer, I helped break up AT&T. That's why you have all your cell phones today. For sovereignty. For the republic. I'm the guy who, at Judicial Watch, which I founded, uncovered the Chinagate scandal. Millions of dollars going to the Clinton campaign, corrupting our political system. For the privacy of citizens. And I'm the only guy to have enjoined the National Security Agency from mass surveillance on hundreds of millions of Americans. Tearing it up. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. Bringing it back. We're going to take this country apart and put it back together again in the way envisioned by our founding fathers. It's not just talk. We're not just regurgitating news stories. Larry Clayman, special Welcome prosecutor. Welcome to this week's edition of Special news. Prosecutor now, with Larry Clayman. Larry. Late breaking developments on a number of fronts, different cases. We've got two great guests today. We've got Sheriff Joe Arpaio, America's sheriff. And we've got Ben Stein, of course, that great conservative writer, thinker, Former Yale lawyer. He's a Yale lawyer. He's not practicing law at the current time, but he's extremely bright. And he's going to give us his views on what's happening with impeachment and other issues in this country today. But I want to turn initially to a column that I wrote that's going to appear this weekend in WorldNetDaily.com, also on Freedom Watch's website at FreedomWatchUSA.org. It's about the problems with our federal judiciary. I've talked about this before. And it's become most pronounced, and we've seen it this week in particular. As you know, I have two lawsuits, many more than just two, but two that I'm going to talk about right now. One for Dr. Jerome Corsi against Robert Mueller. Of course, we've previously indicted Robert Mueller for crimes against Corsi. That was in our citizens' grand jury. And in fact, he will be tried, criminally tried for his crimes in the spring. But this was a civil suit that I brought for Dr. Corsi because he was illegally surveilled. He was threatened with indictment if he wouldn't lie and implicate the president in Russian collusion during Mueller's witch hunt. And grand jury secrecy was violated. Information was released to smear Corsi to coerce him to testify falsely. So we sued Mueller. And the case ultimately wound up in front of a Clinton appointed judge, Judge Ellen Siegel Uvell. Now, the second case deals with my client, Sheriff Arpaio, and he sued CNN, Chris Cuomo, Fredo, as we call him, and Jeff Zucker, the head of CNN, as well as Rolling Stone and Huffington Post for having published that he was a convicted felon. Of course, Sheriff Arpaio was not a convicted felon. He was found liable for a misdemeanor. He was pardoned by the president, of course, the forces of the left. And you'll see in my column, I'm talking about a very leftist lawyer, Michael Tiger, who I have unfortunately experienced in D.C. bar disciplinary proceedings, who also filed a complaint against Kellyanne Conway for simple remarks that she filed or made on MSNBC. These forces are converging right now. And the Arpaio case was assigned randomly to Judge Royce Lambert, who I've always been very complimentary of. Of all the judges in the D.C. federal court, he's the one with the most courage, with the most intellectual honesty. But he has strayed from that from time to time. I saw that during the Clinton years when he wouldn't allow me to depose Hillary Clinton and when he essentially deep sixed her email scandal when she had hidden and destroyed or at least attempted to destroy almost a million email that should have been produced to Judicial Watch, to Congress and Ken Starr. So he's not always been pure, but he's the best of the judges that you have. But let me explain to you what happened in these two cases. In the Corsi case, the matter went in front of Judge Helen Siegel Uvell. And we had an oral argument a few weeks ago. I talked about that on our radio show. And in that oral argument, she said, well, Mr. Clayman, you don't know that, Corsi, that, that Robert Mueller was the one who ordered that either Corsi commit perjury or he be indicted. You don't know that, do you? And I said, well, he's the head of the office. Who else is going to be in charge? He's where the buck stops, Your Honor. And besides, at a preliminary case like this, <clears throat> at the outset of a case, all you really have to plead is what you think the facts will show. And I knew she was going to give us a hard time. She's very partisan. She's very leftist. And she was very skeptical. And I said, if you don't believe 
that Mueller was behind this, then you live on Pluto. And she says, well, I guess I live on Mars. Well, sure enough, yesterday she dismissed Corsi's case. Now, of course, we still have Mueller under indictment. I'll be taking an appeal of that case. But this is an example of why the federal judiciary, we need a better system of selecting judges. We need to take the politics out of it. We need to get judges who decide neutrally. Months ago, a judge in the Northern District of California, that's San Francisco, federal court, Judge John Tiger, enjoined the president with regard to asylum for illegal immigrants. The president, of course, is correctly trying to limit the number of illegal immigrants coming into the United States. John Tiger, a very leftist judge, who happens to be the son of Michael Tiger, who sat on this disciplinary committee that I was involved with of the D.C. Bar, who filed the case against Kellyanne Conway, who not coincidentally intervened in a recent case against Sheriff Arpaio and argued that his pardon should be, in fact, nullified, that in effect, he should go back to the lower court judge in Arizona and be sentenced to prison. His son, equally as leftist, enjoined President Trump. And in response to that, President Trump simply stated, this is what I'm going through with these Obama appointed justices, judges rather. Now, then Chief Justice Robert comes to the defense of John Tiger and other judges. And we all know that the judiciary is politicized. We know that you can gauge with almost exact certainty on a case that has a political element or a social element like abortion, how a judge is going to rule based upon who appointed he or she. And in fact, even the leftist fake news media always reports what judge made the decision and who appointed him or her. But Roberts came out and said, oh, we're all neutral. Doesn't matter whether it's a Clinton judge or an Obama judge or a Bush judge. We always rule with regard to the law, and that's all we ever do. Well, you know what? Roberts, who's gone far left himself in recent years, I mean, he basically was a closet leftist, maybe just closet generally. There are many rumors in Washington. I don't hold that against him, but, you know, whatever the case may be, he should be honest with the American people. Roberts could be a Supreme Court justice, perhaps, on Pluto, where I suggested that you'd have to be if you didn't believe Robert Mueller was, in fact, ordering Corsi to be indicted if he didn't lie. Sure enough, Uvell ruled against Mueller, excuse me, against Corsi and threw the case out. We're going to be, of course, taking that on appeal, and the case will probably wind up in the Supreme Court. Now, with regard to the Arpaio case with Lamberth, Judge Lamberth also dismissed the case yesterday with prejudice. He acknowledged that CNN, Rolling Stone, and Huffington Post had, in fact, defamed Arpaio but said that we had not pled with enough specificity the requirement of actual malice for a public figure like Sheriff Arpaio. Well, it just so happens that we did plead it with specificity. But I also told the judge at a prior hearing where we had the oral argument on the defendant's motion to dismiss, I said, Your Honor, if you'd like, I can amend it and make it more specific. Well, he never gave me the chance. He dismissed it. So we're going to be refiling the case. I can easily put enough specificity in there. The standard is that something that was published was false or with reckless disregard to the truth. Now, clearly, these media entities cover Sheriff Arpaio very closely. He, of course, is a way to get at President Trump. He's anti-illegal immigrant. He's taken strong stands. They know exactly the score with regard to Arpaio, that he's not a convicted felon. So I'm going to shove it right back at Judge Lambert. And although I love the guy, I've seen it over time that he has bailed out for particular reasons. I mean, he thought he was doing Arpaio a favor yesterday by saying that Arpaio was defamed and he was damaged and this is wrong. But that's not enough. We need justice here. These news entities need to pay through their nose or through whatever because they've harmed Arpaio. And that's the only way you're going to have any kind of justice. But it points out, and what's what I've been saying from, from day one, and it's why I founded Judicial Watch back in 1994. It's why I'm continuing on doing the work that I used to do at Judicial Watch, at Freedom Watch. Judicial Watch really does not do the hard-hitting cases. You know, they don't take losses like this because they file easy cases. They file FOIA cases. You always get documents. You never lose a FOIA case. But what good are the documents if you don't use the documents? Now, you know, yours truly, Larry Clayman, I take risks at great expense to Freedom Watch and my private clients and my private cases. We file cases that actually can bring about justice. 
We have documents in those cases. I also file FOIA cases, but we seek to use those documents in real court cases for real clients to get justice. And that's what separates us from Judicial Watch, because see, Tom Fitton's not a lawyer, and that's why he changed the mission to mostly transparency in government after I left to run for the U.S. Senate in Florida. But getting back to this issue is that the Founding Fathers were very enlightened, but they weren't God, and they made mistakes. And I believe their biggest mistake was to give federal judges life tenure because they feel that they're above the law. They can make the decision, their decisions on the basis of politics. In, in, in Judge Lambert's case, probably he's going to issue a very strong ruling with regard to Hillary Clinton soon and didn't want to seem like he was bending over backwards to an activist uh, like Sheriff Arpaio and an activist like his lawyer, Larry Klayman. It's the only way you can explain it, because the decision makes absolutely no sense at all. But you get it from both sides, and you can gauge with almost exact certain certainty how a judge is going to rule based upon who appointed him to the bench. And that is why we need to change the system of how we appoint justices, judges. And it's why in the case of both Arpaio and Dr. Corsi, we will be pursuing appeals and we will keep fighting and we will never end. Now, let's talk about another injustice here, because Clive and Bundy is co coming to trial and is coming to a decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And this was a case that was started by the Trump Justice Department in terms of the appeal. The, the indictment of Clive and Bundy was dismissed, yet we now have it up on appeal. So you have the injustice in the Justice Department on top of everything else. And this is a serious situation, and it's why we need to reform our entire legal system. And that's why go to freedomwatchusa.org, contribute to our cause. Make sure that you join our Justice League, because we need to fight against this injustice, because this is the kind of thing that's gonna to lead to a revolution if we don't have a legal system that works for the American people. And of course, we have another situation out there. We now know that Jeffrey Epstein indeed was murdered. I said weeks ago, who were the likely suspects? The Clintons. Probably was a mafia hit. I'm going to be right back with Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Stay tuned. Dangerous. You don't care. You use the court and the law. Lethal. This is bad. Special prosecutor. Very bad. Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. I'm back with my friend, my colleague, my hero, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, and of course my client. And Sheriff, yesterday we had a temporary setback with regard to Judge Royce Lambert, who's generally a pretty good judge, but. He essentially chickened out, <laughs> but we're going to be back in front of him very shortly. I explained in the opening segment exactly what this was all about. But I want you to explain, and we've got about six minutes, you know, why it's so important that not just you, but other people not be, be smeared by this fake news leftist media and what's been happening with you in that regard. Of course, you're running for sheriff again in Maricopa County and how this can be very damaging and how people like you need to stand up to this fake news media and take action. Of course, we at Freedom Watch have a leftist media strike force, which we brought this case on behalf of for you. So tell the American people what happened to you and why this is so damaging. Well, first of all, I'm not alone. You know, they've been going after uh, President Trump. Actually, uh, the uh, uh, the media that uh, you uh, were nice enough uh, to handle f for me uh, you know, CNN, Huffington Post, Rolling Stone, those are one of the few, not few, there's many of them to go after the president. Now they're going after me. And I I, I just, I don't agree uh, uh, with the judge's final uh, remarks of, uh, about malice, uh, because if there any guy that fits under the word, it's me. And it goes back, Larry, to after Holder, former attorney general, and former President uh, Obama took office, 60 days, they started the alleged racial profiling against me, and they finally ended up 
years, years later and got me on a contempt of court misdemeanor, which is the same charge as a barking dog where you look at the penalty. Took them all those years. And that's what started uh, this lawsuit, because if I wasn't involved in that situation and did not uh, uh, get on, uh, I think I got on CNN a couple of times before that, talking about the birth certificate where Como tried to destroy me. So he sure knew who I was. And then he goes and calls me a convicted felon. Uh, deeper than that, Larry, they wanted to get me out, and they use... Uh, uh, the uh, civil procedures against a very, very biased federal judge. They wouldn't even give me a, uh, a jury trial, charge me with the wrong charge. I can go on 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 a bias. And Larry, I was a top federal guy with the U.S. Drug Enforcement all over the world, and so I know how the federal system operates. And I've always respected judges. I never had a problem, federal, state, you name it, in my 58 years. And I bump into the most biased federal judges I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not going to go into the connections that uh, those judges had with their family. I won't get into that right now. So here I am sitting at a defense table for eight to ten days before a lone judge on a contempt of court, and I think I got two parking tickets in my life, two parking tickets in my life, and I have to sit down at a defense where the fix was in to begin with, no doubt about that, and now repercussions after that's over, they're still after me, call me a convicted felon, went to prison, and I have to put up with all that garbage. You know, I may be a, uh, a elected official, but I think politicians and elected officials should have some, some, uh, you know, whatever we Protection. call it, some fairness, fairness, because if they can do that to me, they can do it to anybody. Now they talk about political. What am I, about me personal? I own a couple businesses here. I'm known around the world. I ran for office after that. Okay, I'm sure that affected my race. But beyond that, what about me as a person? Now I have to be in my hometown, and people think I'm a convicted felon where I can't vote, I can't uh, carry a weapon. Over what? over a misdemeanor contempt of court witch hunt. So I have to look at my reputation. I've been married 61 years. I have two great kids. As I said, I got a couple of businesses. I've been in Arizona since 1978 when I was transferred here to take over the federal drug enforcement. And then Shira for 24 years. And I'm not going to get into my other history during the Army when the Korean War broke out. I was a cop in Washington, D.C., a cop in Vegas, 27 years with the U.S. Drug Enforcement, 24 years as sheriff, and I end up in the media that I'm a convicted felon, and you have to show malice? What malice? I've been, I've been everybody in the universe knows who I am. They know. And then they hit me with this uh, charge. And what are they? Well, we're going to get slapped? sheriff. We're going to get justice here. And I'm going to put this case right back in front of Lamberth. He wants more specificity. He'll get more specificity. But this tells you that, you know, fun and games occurs on both sides of the federal judiciary. It's one reason why they should never have had life tenure. They need to be held accountable to the American people. State judges can be voted out of office, but you can't do that with federal judges. And you've been victimized here. So too was my client, Jerry Corsi, yesterday in another case. But thank you for everything you do. We're going to bring you back. You're my good friend. You're my colleague. And we will get justice for you. God bless you, Sheriff. And now, four 
words that make corrupt politicians make wee-wee in their little pants. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this president. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. Be the one who makes our country great again. Go to freedomwatchusa.org and donate. I'm back with my good friend, my colleague, a Yale lawyer, Yale educated. He is a lawyer. Ben Stein is the person we're talking about, a very prominent person, someone who was very successful in Hollywood, even as a conservative. And that says something. Ben Stein's money, among many other things, uh, Forrest Bueller, one of the very famous movies that he starred in that really launched his career. He actually uh, he had Jimmy Kimmel at one time as one of his apprentices, a writer. Uh, ben knows his way around this country, does a lot of commentary. Ben, welcome to Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. It's my honor to have you on. And I wanted to get my your pleasure. take on the whole state of the nation and where we're going with this Trump impeachment, where you think it's going to come out. Uh, and, you know, frankly, just anything else that you can add. Well, I think the impeachment thing is a disgrace to mankind. I mean, I think it's a disgrace to the Constitution. I think it's a disgrace to every living American and every American who fought for the Constitution and who helped draft the Constitution and who fought in every one of our wars to keep us free under the Constitution because it's it's no more than a Soviet-style witch hunt. And uh, there's no there's no end to it uh, because the Democrats are never going to let there be an end to it. There's never going to be an end to it as long as the Democrats can keep finding it in their hearts to persecute Trump for something that never happened. I mean, there, there's just no evidence that anything happened. I mean, there's no evidence that anything nefarious ever happened. There's no, there's something happened. I mean, I don't know what to say. Something happened. Uh, Trump had a phone call with the head of the Ukraine, but, uh, Many, many people who were on that call said there was nothing wrong with the phone call. And there's just, uh, and there, 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 was, there was clearly nothing wrong with the phone call. And all the people are saying that there was something wrong with the phone call are anti Trump activists and uh, not uh, really trustworthy. At least I, I think, it's just in my opinion, not really trustworthy. Well, you know, I agree with you. There was no crime. There certainly is no impeachable offense. I wish that the president hadn't mentioned. Joe Biden during that call, it was unnecessary, particularly after he was Biden cleared in the Russian co collusion investigation, because you know what? Well, you know, it's interesting. Trump is not a lawyer, Larry, and he doesn't he does, he does things that are not are not very lawyerly. And sometimes he just shoots off his mouth too much. Well, you know, it reminds me of Watergate with uh, President Nixon, who was a great man. You know, he got enmeshed in that. Great man. And he, he, he really didn't need to break into Watergate <laughs> to figure out that McGovern was going to lose the election. He was about 30 points down. It was unnecessary. No, that, was a, that was just idiotic. On, but he didn't really plan that. I mean, that was planned by John Mitchell and by uh, various other people at the White House who were working on the Nixon campaign, and they didn't need to do any of it. They didn't, all Nixon really basically did to do was have a pulse at the time of the election, and he was going to win overwhelmingly. So it, it, that was a terrible mistake. But Nixon made many other mistakes in that regard. He should have fired John Dean long before John Dean was not a reliable or trustworthy person. We I mean, keep going back to this word trustworthy. I mean, these, it's unfortunate, but President Trump, who is himself a very trustworthy guy, is not surrounded by trustworthy guys, and he's and he's he's paying a heavy price for it. Well, you're right, and of course, you know, I I misspoke a little bit. Yes, it was it was the Watergate burglars and others who had arranged for that, and it was the president who attempted to cover it up. But yeah, the, the same thing with Biden. He didn't cover it up, but he didn't attempt. He didn't do a very good job at attempting to cover it yeah. up. He did a pretty he did, he, job. He of, didn't. You're you're right, and I guess Henry Kissinger got out unscathed. He actually arranged for the break-in of the Book Brookings Institution as well. <laughs> but Did but, Henry Kissinger do that? I think Henry Kissinger might have had a word in about it, but I don't think he arranged for it. I mean, Henry Kissinger hated the people at the Brookings Institution, at least as far as I'm aware, but I don't think he had anything to do with breaking into it. And I don't know, the Brookings Institution is a pretty much of a one-trick pony, and, uh, and nobody put much trust in anything they had to say either. I mean, we, again, we go back to this word trust, we we keep going to back to the word trust. There's just no trustworthy information that Trump did anything wrong. 
and it's Ukraine, and there's no trustworthy information that Nixon ever did anything wrong with regard to Watergate. Watergate was a, uh, just a trivial, ridiculous, nothing thing. And the idea that they kicked the president, who was one of the most accomplished presidents we've ever had out of office over it, is just insanity. It's just insanity. I agree with you, Ben. You know, and what was the insanity here is, is that I don't think Biden, who obviously is in very bad health, I mean, the poor guy's been shot up with, uh, you know, to make himself look young with Botox. But more important than that, he can't get a sentence out of his mouth. It looks like he's going to have a stroke any minute because there's something that's impaired neurologically. I know. I know. He's not with. well. He's not well. He's not yeah, well. I mean, he, and I don't think he's going to even get the nomination at this point. I mean, I, I think Mrs. Uh, Warren is uh, leading for the nomination. And, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's something extremely maddening about Mrs. Warren. It's interesting. I was talking to a woman on the phone uh, this morning. Who's a very active Democrat, but she said uh, Mrs. Warren makes her just want to slap her. She just there's there's something so rude and so shrill and so demanding and commanding about her. She just wants she's just like begging to be slapped. Well, she suffers from the Hillary Clinton syndrome in some ways, you know. Yeah, she and, does. Uh, she's always right. She's got to always be right. Nobody else could ever be right. She's got to always be right. And she's got to always be right in such a way that the other person who's talking about her, too, is not only wrong, but stupid and ignoramus. I mean, Mrs. Mrs. Clinton got the idea somehow, maybe a Yale, maybe a Wellesley, that she was a great genius. But she isn't. She, she's not a great genius. And there never was any evidence that she was a great genius. Well, you know, we've had pres and, and I'm not defending her. I'm obviously not uh, in favor of her policies, maybe breaking up the social media companies may be the only thing I agree on. But we've had presidents that haven't had to be geniuses, that had great instincts. I mean, you know, in the sense of academics, not at your level Absolutely. or anybody else's level. Absolutely. You know, no, no, no. Reagan. Well, Dwight Eisenhower was such a person. Dwight Eisenhower was a person who was not a genius by any kind of scholastic measurement. And yet he was a great leader and, and very, 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 very good gut feelings about how to handle the Russians in world in Europe after World War II. He had genius ideas about how to handle them. Yeah, and Ronald Reagan was not an academic genius either, but he, he was a genius in terms of understanding dynamics in the nation and the world. And that's Ronald what we Reagan need. was an unsur unsurpassed genius and leadership for the free, for freedom and decency. My wife and I, every night, say prayers, and we say prayers for people who fight for de decency and for the dignity of the individual, and Ronald Reagan is way, way, way up there at the top. Yeah. I agree. Every I, time I go to, to the his library in Simi Valley, I tear over, you know, just listening oh, to absolutely. him. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, by the way, let me just tell you something which I don't think I've ever spoken about on the radio or on TV before which was that years ago I was invited to speak at the Reagan Library, and the special treat, although they didn't pay me, the special treat was that I would get to have dinner with Mrs. Reagan just by myself. And uh, Mrs. I, I said to her, what I really want to know is, was it better being first lady or was it better being a star on the, Paramount lot, on the, sorry, on the MGM lot? She said it was unequivocally better to be a star on the MGM lot. And, and uh, because there's always attacking you when you're first lady, whereas if you're a star on the MGM lot, nobody dares to attack you. And I thought that was very interesting, a very interesting commentary on Hollywood versus politics. Well, it is. And, you know, that's that's reality. When I go to Washington, D.C., Ben, you go to I mean, there's an evil cloud hanging over the place. And it's it's just vicious. It's it's not. It is. It is a nice place. It is vicious. It's really special. Yeah. I'm going to Washington D.C. tomorrow, and I'm going to a dinner of the American Spectator, which is one of the few sane places left in Washington, which is a great, great, great conservative magazine. And uh, it, it's a lot of sensible people speaking, but uh, where the rest of them are, I'm sure I don't know, although we have some in the Senate. I think McConnell is a great Senate leader, and he's clever, and he's quiet, and he's cagey. Yeah, he's a great guy, but uh, there are not too many others. Talk about viciousness. Uh, we now learn that what we all thought was true, that Jeffrey Epstein was most likely murdered. And I, I said yes, the he, two main uh, suspects, uh, and other people said this too, have to be the Clintons. They had the most to lose by this. I believe it may have been a mafia hit. They've 
you know, they've had people in their administration before that have had mafia connections. Eighty people died in and around the Clintons in the late I don't 20th doubt century. All. I don't doubt it at all. It's funny when I when we first learned that Mrs. Mr. Epstein, he's been Hillaryed, and I think there's there's something to that. I mean, people that come too close to her wind up dead. Yeah, and you know that's not hate speech for anybody that's listening, whether it's YouTube or anything else. That's just reality. I mean, you can't refute the no, fact I, that over eighty people died during their administration. Many material witnesses. That's more than the law of average. No, there's there, there's too much violence associated with her. Now, don't get me wrong. I may be wrong. She may be as innocent as the driven snow. She may be as pure as a lamb's was sheep's wool. She may be a pure innocent. Totally a hardworking citizen, but it's, something doesn't look right. I know you're being facetious, Ben. You are a comedian, among other things. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> to say that Hillary Clinton is pure might, as the driven snow. Be, I mean, what are we talking she about? She might. You said she might be as pure as the driven snow, but I don't think she is. But she might be. But um, I mean, my wife is the only person I know of that's as pure as the driven snow. But you know, too many people around, around her wind up uh, in unfortunate circumstances without a pulse. Well, and we've seen how vicious she is. Look at what she did recently with Tulsi Gabbard, you know, who has come forward, you know, as a, a leader, at least if not in the Democrat Party, then just generally, even though I don't agree with most of her views. Uh, she does present herself very well. She's articulate. She's attractive. And Hillary resents her deeply and then accused her of being a Russian agent. I mean, if you can believe and that. That was incredible. That was a, absolutely incredible and unforgivable. Unforgivable to a an American country hero of being a Russian asset. I think, I think the phrase she used was a Russian asset. And uh, it's just shameful. It's just shameful that she would do that. Why do you think she did that? Uh, I think she's confused. I think at this stage of her life, she's a bit confused. Now, this is just my opinion. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a gerontologist. But I just think at this stage of her life, she's getting a bit confused. Otherwise known as senility. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say she's senile, but I'd say she's getting a bit confused. I mean, I know I'm getting old and I'm getting a bit confused, but I'm not in a position of authority where anybody pays much attention to what I have to say. But Mrs. Clinton is. Anything she says gets put on the TV right away. Yeah. And well, people play a, calls, pay a lot of it. They pay a lot of attention to what you say, Ben. Ben's on the speaking well, circuit. You know. Well, give give us your final they thoughts. We only have about a minute, minute and a half. Where do you think this impeachment thing, what is it going to do to our economy? Because you are I don't think it's going to do a thing expert. to our economy. I don't think – I think the economy is so strong that it's not going to do a thing to it. But what worries me about the economy is we're running up enormous federal deficits, just enormous ones. And what we're really running into is the limits of supply side. The supply side – it's always based on putting a huge federal deficit out there and uh, spending the money uh, to, uh, so, so to speak, rebuild the country, although this country doesn't really need much rebuilding. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I think the economy is going to be strong for a long time to come. Where should the American people put their money right now? We've got about a minute just, left. Just, just the S&P 500 index fund. Just the regular old spiders, as they're called. I just uh, buy them for free, for no commission, no holding fee, no no fees at all. Buy them from Standard Poor's. Buy, sorry, buy them from Fidelity. Buy them from uh, Merrill Lynch. That's where I usually buy my stock. And uh, it's a very, very easy thing to do, very easily done. All you do is call your broker, ask him to send you a booklet about what the S&P 500 is, and then ask him to uh, buy you a... Uh, a few shares, and they're all set. You think the stock market's going to continue to go up? Uh, well, it's, it's been moving sort of horizontally lately, but I think it'll do fine. I mean, it'll, okay. it'll have corrections. It'll have corrections, and I wouldn't be surprised if it had a correction of a few thousand points at some point, but I don't think it's going to be crashing. Well, Ben, I want to thank you for coming on. You're my good friend. Really enjoy the time we spend together. Uh, you are a great patriot, and you're, you're very smart. People should listen to what you have to say. So go out and buy one of Ben's books, because he's a great writer. Uh, anyway, I'll see you back in L.A., and I hope you'll be well. Before. 
before he was a trial lawyer, he sliced him and diced him. People used to ask me, Larry, what caused you to start Judicial Watch and now Freedom Watch, given the powerful forces in this country that put you at risk? In a meat packing plant. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. A very special prosecutor, Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. Fellow patriots, Americans, those who believe in our Constitution and the rule of law, judges are our most important public servants. I've always said that. They were put here by our founding fathers and the federal system to protect us from the tyranny of the federal government as well as our own tyranny against ourselves. When judges get very politicized, when they make decisions on the basis of matters that are not on the facts or on the law, This is extremely dangerous because we lose our protection because by its very nature, both the executive and legislative branches of government can do things against the American people or against individuals and in general that are tyrannical. We saw what happened with Clive and Bundy, uh, the raid on his ranch where his family was threatened with death, where his sister was thrown to the ground and assaulted, his sons tased, his cattle destroyed, buried in a mass grave. What do you do in that circumstance? And we don't want to get to the point that Jefferson predicted we would get to, which was a bloody revolution. He said it's going to happen every other generation. He said we would have to spill blood. We don't want to do that. We don't want to see it happen. So without the judges, without them protecting us, without them protecting people like Sheriff Arpaio or people like Jerome Corsi, and I'm not even talking about protection, just making a fair, neutral ruling without political BS entering into it, then we, the American people, are exposed. And this is exactly what happened in the years, months, and days leading up to 1776, is that King George III kidnapped our legal system. He took our criminal justice system back to the court of St. James. We didn't have any control over our legal system criminally in those days. And that as well as the seizure of firearms, which gave rise to the Second Amendment later after we became a nation and we had a constitution and the Bill of Rights, you know, the right to be secure in your home, Fourth Amendment, from unreasonable searches and seizures, which we were subjected to with the crown, with the British troops on colonial soil. All of this gave rise to a new nation, a constitution and a free republic. And the reason that we had, and and see the framers, they had good intentions, but they didn't understand what was going to happen, is that by giving these federal judges life tenure, they're not accountable. They're untouchable. They're above the law. And I've always said, figuratively speaking, figuratively, not actually, that when the revolution breaks out, the first that will be taken to the guillotines are the federal judges, because they have not protected us. And that's exactly what was true In colonial days with King George, the judges under his direction, appointment, and control were yes men. Of course, they didn't have women judges in those days, unfortunately, but they were yes men. And that is why we then had to take matters into our own hands and create a new nation. Now, 200 and some years later, we're now back where we started. And in my view, it's even worse. So I ask you to go to freedomwatchusa.org, join our judicial selection strike force, join our Justice League, contribute with tax-deductible contributions. I'm probably the only lawyer in this country that will consistently stand up to federal judges. I've paid the price for that. I've paid the price with them. I've paid the price with bar associations and everything else. But you know what? I can't sit still and not say anything. I can't sit still and not do anything. Because I don't want to be part of a legal system that we currently have, which is so inherently corrupt. And that's why I started Judicial Watch in 1994. That's why I ran for the U.S. Senate in 2003. That's why I started Freedom Watch after that race and continue to fight for honesty in our federal system, in our judiciary and in government in general. And that's why I need your help. I need you to join Freedom Watch is Justice League. As I've said, you're the superheroes. You are we the people. This country belongs to us. It does not belong to these compromised federal judges. It doesn't belong to the compromised people in Congress who run around, you know, like the Keystone Cops, 
accomplishing little to nothing, just making a mess and impeaching people for political purposes, or the executive branch, which has a deep state that's trying to stab the president in the back constantly, particularly the intel agencies. So you need to support what we're doing at Freedom Watch. And I want you to donate handsomely because we need to get bigger. I'm short-staffed. I'm overworked. I don't mind being overworked, but we need more help. So go to freedomwatchusa.org, contribute to our cause, join our Justice League, get our newsletters, listen to this radio show, share it. And I'll be back next week with another edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. Until then, God bless you, God bless your family, God bless America, and God save America.